Hello. Can you, can you hear me? Is this... Oops. Yes. Hello. We're, we're all very um, surprised and delighted, of course, to see such a crowd of you so early in the morning. We're slightly r wondering what might be wrong with you, just as we're wondering what might be wrong with us. Um, um, thank you very, very much. I'm trying to find in my bag a little slip, but I'll just tell you about it. Um, in case you haven't seen, I was passing by and picked up a, a little slip of paper about the Harville Secker um, translation award, grant, something, prize. Uh, for, anyway, for young translators, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a prize, right. It's a thousand pounds, but also it involves a sort of mentoring scheme, right? Um, and the language this year is Polish. So if, if there are any young translators among you, um, you must uh, pay attention to that somehow. I'll find the slip. You can even photograph it. Anyway, here I am, um, really here to introduce these three people. Um, Simon Willis on my far right, um, who is digital editor at Intelligent Life, a wonderful magazine if you haven't read it. It's the um, culture magazine of The Economist. Um, and he writes there, actually for both of those things, The Economist and Intelligent Life, about translated books. Um, next up, Toby Lichtig, um, a critic, <clears throat> and fiction in translation editor at the Times Literary Supplement, um, equally writes a lot about works in translation himself. Um, and lastly, Sophie Hughes, a real live translator, um, who uh, is also a critic, writes about uh, works in translation, but whose translation of Ivan Repila's novel, The Boy Who Stole Attila's Horse, has just been published by Pushkin Press. Um, so do pick that up if you can. Um, we're here to speak about what works in translation. Um, I think, to begin with, there are two versions of that question, aren't there? There's sort of what works in terms of what sells, what people tend to, tend to think works as readers, and then a sort of more close-up version of what works for you textually, you know, regardless of whether it's fashionable or it becomes popular somehow accidentally. So. Um, Perhaps we could start by talking about the first, anyway, a sort of the things that have been commercially successful. Is, is one of the sort of standards for that issue whether or not people think of it as a translation? I mean, whether they receive it as a book that's effectively written in their own language by somebody who happens to have a foreign name? Simon. Um, well, I think, I mean, one of the declared aims of lots of translators is to write a translation which feels to the reader as though they're getting the book itself, nothing mediated about it, so that they're just, you know, they're being delivered the, the thing as it was intended by the writer. And I think that's certainly, that sort of smoothness is, is a big part of what works in translation from a sort of commercial point of view. And mm. I guess it's probably one thing that publishers look for when they're commissioning translations uh, is, is something that, that just reads perfectly fluently in English without any of the... Of the knots or complications coming through. I mean, I imagine that's something that publishers look for. Yes, absolutely. I, I would agree with that. And that, that sense of um, self-effacement, I guess. And I suppose when translated works do well commercially, there's always a sense of in spite of the fact that this book comes from Norway and you know, we don't know who this author is because he's Norwegian or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I, I would entirely agree with that. And yet one of the inherent points of reading literature and one of the reasons why I think that probably most of us end up reading fiction is because we want to learn about other people's experiences and often the attraction with foreign literature, which is always translated or almost always translated, is that it does give us this sense of the otherness. So this is kind of strange dichotomy whereby on the one hand we want something that's strange to us and on the other we want it to be absolutely like you said before, is almost this panel of glass, which is a metaphor that gets used a lot. The panel of glass that means that if the translation is perfect, you don't realise you're looking through the, the, mm -hmm. the pane of glass. If there are a few little scratches in the pane, what happens at that moment? Does, what happens to your reading experience and to your experience of the story and of that culture often? Because the books... This is something I was talking to someone about yesterday, whereby um, often I think that publishers publishing translations would like a French book set in Paris or a Spanish book in which there's... A, I'm, I'm now being guilty of the same stereotypes, but a Spanish book with, with, with a bullfight in it. I think, there's, I, think, I think there's an element of that where the, the foreignness is, is, is the attraction. But why isn't the translated aspect of that an attraction? Why do we want to clean that aspect out? Well, it's it's worth it? saying that you know, two of the most talked about uh, literary projects of the last few years are both translated 
things, and they're very grand and difficult um, things. The Naus Guard, my struggles, six volumes of autobiography, um, you know, knotty and tangled and difficult and, and enormous. And then the Ferrante Neapolitan novels, uh, mm. which have managed to kind of get this extraordinary momentum behind them. Um, kind of unprecedented. I mean, there, there aren't that many examples like that where they just sort of take over all the conversation. Uh, absolutely, and, and the, one of the interesting things about that is why have they done so well? And it comes back to the question of what makes a good translated book. The answer is what makes a good book, which is a rather right, larger exactly. conversation. And Knausgaard, it is not about being Norwegian or Norway. It's about the experience of one person. And from that, we extrapolate what it is to be a human being. Ferrante, yes, there's a lot of Neapolitan flavour, but it's about a friendship, it's about many things. It's not about Italy as such. And it's this universal quality, I think, that has made these two projects so incredibly successful. I think that, that is true. I mean, that is something to do with, uh, um, nothing to do with translation, but actually to do with that principle of, you know, the more specific you can make it, the more universal it will be. But um, just going back to your point, um, Sophie, about um, <clears throat> what people want these things to be. The, um, the Mexican writer Jorge Volpi was at the centre of a, a movement that they decided to call the crack. Is that right? Am I getting this the wrong way around? Anyway, there was a boom, the boom, and then there's a crack. Um, the boom is the um, Vargas Llosa, uh, Garcia Marquez, that, um, yeah, that, that group of people. And this new, now no longer new group, um, set themselves up not entirely in opposition to them, but as a subsequent movement, right? And that's why these sounds were evoked. Um, specifically because they wanted to say, well, just because we're Latin American writers, we don't have to write magical realism, or we don't have to write things set here. What if we want to write about Adolf Eichmann? You know, what if we want to write about the Second World War? These are the subjects that interest us. We don't want to be cramped, right? And, um, and yet they had to announce that and form themselves as some sort of movement in order to go forward. Because there was this, this came up also when Garcia Marquez died, I think, that people were saying, well, do, do we, we like the books, but do we really understand the world they came from? People were having to sort of translate the origin as opposed to just the words, right? I mean... Yeah. No, I think that's, I think it's true. I think for, for me, listening to you speak there, the question is also what the reader wants and what the publisher thinks the reader wants. And that, of course, you know, I'm, not, I'm not a publisher and I'm very glad I'm not because I think the decision is incredibly difficult to make. Um, yesterday, someone was telling me that they'd been and had a meeting trying to sell a particular book which was um, written by an author with an incredibly sp Spanish-sounding name um, and it was set, I think, in India. And this publisher from Australia had said, no, no, no. Within the first sentence, she, you know, she'd done her little soundbite about what the... No oh, no, no, no. On to the next book. I found that very interesting and slightly dis disheartening. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe the thing about the, the Ferranta, for example, is that at least she's from there. Although we don't know much about her. I mean, <laughs> no, no, on, maybe you should talk a bit about Ferranta. Maybe you should talk... One of you should somehow distribute Knausgaard and Ferranta. <laughs> well, maybe. I mean, Ferranta is very mysterious... Uh, writer um, judging by what the name on the cover you assume she's a woman but no one really knows who she is, I, apparently only her publisher knows who she is um, She's now given an interview to the Paris Review apparently but oh, they, yeah, oh, but they weren't Not with a photo or No, no right. right. <laughs> kind of bank, Banksy-esque way behind, yeah. behind the mask um, And, she, and, and, and it, she's I mean, compared with Knausgaard, a very different kind of writer, much sort of knottier and more composed but um, in a sense doing a similar sort of job of retrieval and excavation of her own very difficult past over a very long stretch um, of, of four novels, I think. Um, so they're both, I think they're both sort of tapping into some desire that people have for a writer to be uh, revealing themselves in some, in some way, um, although they're doing it in very different ways and she's chosen to sort of hide herself behind this, behind this screen, whereas Nausgaard is, you know, all out there. He's done exactly the opposite and he's become this celebrity and he, he talks frequently and his, his whole project is about unpicking absolutely everything and exposing every raw detail of himself. But I think it's, it's interesting, that I think I completely agree with you, these are the two possibly most significant literary projects of the past couple of years and the way in which they They've, you know, they've all come out in their native countries. That's all done. But as English readers, we're still waiting mm. for the kind of the, the sort of second wave of that to come. And I think that's actually tremendously exciting because <laughs> we, 
it's, it's like being a 19th century reader again where we're waiting for the next instalment. Um, so I think that's one of, the re- one of the reasons why they've done so well as well. They're both so different as well. I think what, mm. the, what, what appeals to us about Nausgaard, for me certainly as a reader, was the concept, the idea that this man was laying bare, that there was some controversy around, around his family having been very unhappy about some certain things that he wrote and him kind of being the delinquent child of the family and saying, I don't care, I have to write what I want to write, and then immediately want to read what he had to write. Um, whereas with Ferrante's kind of, you he get, she, we speak more as critics, we, I've read more about her style, about her writing, about her exploration of the human condition, as you say, whereas with Nausgaard there's this element of celebrity, which is, you know, aided by his yeah. persona. And I think most critics would agree that Ferrante's style is far more interesting and better. I mean, obviously, I, I have read neither in the original, so we're falling back on the translations, <laughs> yeah. which is something we were all aware of, but I mean, the way Knausgaard writes, it, it's, it is full of longueurs, and you can argue that those, those are there for a reason, but... Yeah. I think they're one of the sort of interesting things about, mm. about... I mean, the way he allows some pretty ropey writing, in some ways, into the books, uh, and has said so himself. You know, he, he wrote them very quickly. He didn't uh, think too much about them as he was going along. Some passages are very composed, and, and the structure is very sort of ornate in some ways. But, the, um, but on the page, they're just very direct, and, and he, he'll, he'll allow himself to slip into cliché. And I think that's part of the appeal of the books in some way. There's no distance between uh, the reader and the writer's mind. It doesn't seem like he's done too much in the way of sort of self-editing as he's gone along and I think that's one of the, one of the dynamics that people enjoy in the books we could ask you now is that Don Bartlett or is well, that exactly, Nausgaard well exactly it's a very good question yeah I mean I think I think um, Nausgaard has said that he has left that stuff in deliberately so I can only assume that Bartlett has gone along with that although again I haven't read them in the original so I don't know it would be quite a good novel, actually, the translator as editor, you know, the sort of Raymond Carver, Gordon Lish relationship, but the translator just cuts everything out. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Although I think you'd get found out quite quickly, wouldn't you? Somebody would read the original. Um, well, well, I've <coughs> spoken to translators who privately admit that they do sometimes improve the books they translate. Oh, we'd hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <You'd> hope so. <laughs> Sophie, surely. <laughs> I can't say I've ever improved anything. Like, certainly, you know, there's a temptation, I think... Uh, some translators that I've spoken to say that the more they like the book, the more tempted or the more, the more they seem to, to find themselves tweaking things a little bit more or spending more time on it, perhaps. And more time inevitably means that you are doing more tweaking, let's put it like that. Mm. But then for, for me, I find that if, some, if I don't have an affiliation, if I don't feel an affinity with the text, I, it's then that I find myself starting to say, well, that's actually not quite the right word, is it? So let's put this word. And then you realise you, that you must not do that. You know, I am one of the translators who thinks that you must not do that where possible. I think other, others just say, well, it's incorrect, so let's correct it. Oh, it's an editorial process as well, isn't it? So you, could call, you can think of yourself as the next editor in the line of editors, which is the original language editor, or the author, the author's friend, his wife... You know, there's lots of us always tweaking texts, which is lovely. They're living things. Yeah, I, well, I think, let's I, come to that. I, Sorry, I, I think this idea of improvement is actually very interesting because to say that you can't improve it on a text automatically assumes that a translation is always slightly inferior to the original, which is not necessarily the case at all. And actually, there was a tremendous, one of those good old-fashioned Times Literary Supplement in the paper I worked for, Letter Debates, um, uh, around Christmas when... Uh, in reviewing uh, a biography of Scott Moncrief, who was Proust's translator, mm. our critic had the temerity to say that Moncrief was more Proustian than Proust, <laughs> i.e. a bit better. <laughs> and everyone got terribly cross. Or and a bit people, longer, maybe, it just oh, meant. Bit, yeah, yeah, I mean. yeah, exactly. So, but, but, uh, and everyone got terribly cross, and then, then people came weighed in to defend him. But it, it really sparked this idea of, can a translation actually be better than the original work? Well, yeah. I mean, we're coming back to the sort of more close-up um, ideas. But this, this question you raised about people sort of waiting for the next instalment is very interesting, I think, because um, this came up. I work at The Telegraph, and it came up when the, uh, the Michel Welbeck book came out, where you think, OK, well, do we review this when it comes out in English, where all our readers can actually read it? Or do we review it when it's news, where some people can read it in French and it's out in the world? And in the end, you sort of think, well, French isn't such an obscure language. Um, we are in the age of the internet. Perhaps we should actually deliver this as news and not just... Um, I think there was, a, there was a, a translation of that, not the translation, but a translation um, done very quickly after the Ebdo attacks. Oh, is that right? Uh, I think by Frank Wynne, possibly. Uh, anyway, the, the novel is coming out in English 
uh, late, minute, yeah. late September, quite soon, but there, I think there is sort of floating around somewhere a version of it in English, if you're very curious and sort oh, of want to go Oh, that's good. Well, I, do, I just think that there is, that it sort of divides the world in this really interesting way, sort of almost steps. There are some people who've already read the next Ferrante, or there are some people who've already read the next Nous Guard, or, you know, and then uh, there are some of us who are behind on a volume and, you know, hang on, we're not quite waiting for number four yet, or this kind of thing. And it, may, it does generate a certain excitement. Right? That's very interesting, too, I think, again, for publishers, because, of course, who has written the review it means for the translation, the, the blurb that you're going to get on the front. So in its original language, it would have been reviewed already. And certainly for English books moving into, into other languages, that New York review of books or that TLS quote makes all the difference in, in the foreign language because they recognise quite a few of our, of our journals and reviews and newspapers' names and even our critics. I know that a book by um, Forrest Gander in the US was published by Sexto Piso, which is in the Mexico sand, and did incredibly well. Had this beautiful Jeanette Winterson quote. They used it. Uh, it got to Spain, and they'd used a Mexican translator, and by the time it arrived in Spain, because I don't know how much people know, but there's a bit of a triangle. It sort of goes to Spain first, and then back to Latin America, even though it's been published and translated, you know, in terms of reader reception, because again, they wait for the El País review, you know, and then you kind of get this snowball. But by the time it reached Spain, they were talking about it being too much of a Mexican translation. So, so rude. And, the, and, all of, and so then, of course, the next, the next publication, the next edition, didn't have the reviews. So this, there was never any tail, tailing of reviews of, of names that were recognisable. I think the reviews are quite an interesting, interesting aspect. Like we didn't read any reviews of the Naus Guards before it arrived into English, did we? Mm. I didn't. I never. No, Should we translate right. some reviews as well and, you know, and stop thinking that just our reviewers in our country? Or is there a reader reception that's different here than in Norway? That's well, I think, I think that's right. I mean, it's part of what you were saying in a way, that despite the fact that you've been talking about the difference between Ferrante and Nausgaard, that you know, one is invisible and one is highly visible uh, and writes about himself <coughs> in that way. In fact, um, they share a fundamental similarity, which is they come, they come packaged in a myth. Right. That's how we receive them. And so that myth is presented to English readers. It's somehow already accumulated. And if you can't have the reviews, then at least you get the persona. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think that's true of Stieg Larsson. Stieg Larsson had a story. You know, it's a posthumously published thing. You know, there's a drama to it. There's, um, I wonder how much that helped the books. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there are many people who never knew anything about the circumstances of the publication of those books, but but maybe that's part of it. Maybe every translated book needs a myth around it or a story or some sort of legend that accompanies it, right? Or look who's back, Hitler. Oh, uh, brilliant. You, know. well, you spotted that before, yeah. didn't you? I, t I don't read German and I was just kind of pootling around at the time I was working, translated, uh, reviewing books or talking about books for um, Days and Confused and I had a kind of column and we were talking about books that may well be translated, books that I felt in, with my, from my languages uh, that should be translated and didn't have deals yet. And I came across Look Who's Back, which is, um, his, name, his name's Timur Vermes. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and thought, this book's going to be really big. And then just, be just because of the because of the content, because it had this glorious cover, which I don't think they've changed in any, any country as far as I've seen, with this very clever cover. Um, and you, you knew, you knew it was going to cause a little cause a little bit of a, a wave of interest. Yeah. I, mean, I, think, I think a specific part of the myth around the Nausgaard book is the impact that those, those books seem to have had on other writers as well. It's, it's, a, it's a particular aspect of the way that book has been received that other writers have been incredibly, so Zadie Smith has you know, written very, very fulsomely about it. Lots of other people have. People we're very familiar with, voices we sort of trust. Um, and I think that's an important part of how translated books often make their way into the Anglophone world if they come via a route that we trust in, in terms of another writer or something like that. I mean, I there are specific reasons for the Nouse Guard, whether there are specific appeals that it has to writers, I think. It's very much about the writing life in those words. That's right. There's, a, there's an Argentinian writer now who writes very slim books, Cesar Aida, who, you know, in New York, everybody is talking about. In London, nobody is talking about yet, but maybe will be talking about. But New York talking about means Zadie Smith. In fact, Adam Thurwell, though, he's here. You know, Harry Kunzru, and a particular group of people who sort of usher that person 
into the into the English speaking well, world. Uh, I mean, the that helps. Chilean writer Alejandro Zambra is another one who exactly. all the kid, cool kids in New York yeah. are really into, <laughs> and then you know that tends to filter over this way afterwards. But it's filtered. <laughs> it's filtered. It's filtered. It's filtered. <laughs> Um, before we get on to the more close-up view, um, is there also a question of what you think should work better? I mean, something... But before we leave the commercial world, um, maybe there's an issue of things that you, you, you're surprised didn't work. You know? So commercially or cri- commercially within literary, the literary Yeah, I mean, things that, oh, well, this should take off. This should work as something that's sort of not translated in that way that we've been discussing, you know, that's adopted rather than translated. Uh, I'm not, <laughs> what springs to mind? I'm not sure. I mean, I really think all of these things depend on how well the thing is translated. Almost anything can work in translation, provided it's really well translated. Mm. And it's very hard. I think it's very hard to pre- given given that it's quite hard to predict what will take off and what won't. Mm. But if you're reading as a critic, I'm interested because I'm a translator. As you're reading, if, what's a good translation then for you, as a, you know, for the critics panel, for the translators in the audience? What what is a good translation? Well, I'm. I am one of these people who, I'll admit, I don't speak other languages, so that may you know, mark me out as a fraud on this panel, but, and, and perhaps that explains why I like translations, where I feel like I'm being given the book. I, you know, reading for me is not an exercise in cross-reference. I don't, I don't necessarily want to have uh, funny little tangles in English that have to then be explained by reference to what they're coming from. You want um, to read it? I want to read it. I want to get into it. I want to be immersed in it. And, and so that's what I want a translation to do. So I'm one of these pane of glass people, and maybe, maybe wrongly. I, I think similarly as well. And I, I think you can tell. You don't need to have a close working knowledge of the original language to know that if something doesn't sound like English, and it, unless mm. there's some stylistic purpose going on where you think, OK, well, there's, there's an oddity to the language, and maybe this is doing something, I'll, I'll, I'll persevere with this. But... You can, you can tell if something's been badly translated because it just it sounds tone deaf. And, and yeah. I think any, any reader will be able to do that. You don't need to be a critic to And to we, know. we were just talking before um, about uh, Michael Hoffman, who's recently published a collection of essays. And there's an essay in there about the Polish poet Herbert. And Hoffman doesn't speak Polish. Um, and, and he's comparing in that essay two sets of translations. And his, his means of doing that is purely with reference to how good the translator's ear is for poetry in English, their poetic ear in, in English, and, uh, and, and in his view, one uh, set of translations succeeds much more than the other, um, but in those terms. Well, yeah. you know, to take the case of probably the, you know, the most commercially and also to a certain extent critically successful um, non-Anglophone novelist of recent years, Murakami. Now, I would be very surprised if many of his Anglophone readers knew Japanese. Um, and yet, you know, it's done extraordinarily well. It's got a lot of critical success. That's down to his translators as well. That there are three translators who translate Murakami. I mean, he himself has said, the style of my books in English is completely dependent on which translator has translated them. And it's sort of a, the cross comparison between the three. Uh, you, need to, you need to do a lot of reading to kind of start noticing the differences. But I think you do pick up on certain things, and it's an interesting little exercise to do. Yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant reference. I mean, it's true that it's become a sort of cult occupation. Oh, a new Murakami book comes out. Which translator is it? <laughs> you know, is it going to be one of the good ones, or is it... Yeah, that's true. I mean, mm, it, th- what you're saying is sort of the opposite, isn't it, of what Nabokov said about translation? You know, where everything had to be incredibly precise, and the more foreign it seemed, or the more... You know, I, I don't know. I, I'm sure I'm saying this wrong, but um, you know, his theory was that it should feel foreign, or that it should, um, in some ways, feel stilted because you're trying to get the exact word. That the idea wasn't to give a perfect rendition of a perfectly enjoyable rendition of a of a novel. I mean, you must be stuck between these things. Well, it's sort. Of, I just feel like it's easy for him to say in this case. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's self-translated, so. Um, yeah, I think with well, self-translation is such a rare case, there's probably no point in talking about it here. But in that case, you know, if, if I don't actually know the quote you're talking about or, or what he said necessarily, but um, I think... Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, th- I don't think... I think it depends on the book, you know. If it's, yeah. if it's this pro stylist, you know, if, it, if you're talking about Javier Marias, mm. then, then it's not about... Um, it, it's not about making the book feel foreign or, ch- or keeping those tangles in. It's about making tangles in English yeah, that, that reflect those tangles, but it must not 
complicate your reading process. Another you can be complicated intellectually. I mean, you can be, you can be confused intellectually. I think that's fine yeah. because I think Harry Marias is a complex writer. But you yeah. must your your reading experience. I think is is really it's, key. I think it's what, it's what Walter Binyamin said about it has to be it has to be true to the intention, true to the intention of the author, and that, I think that's what you that's that's what that sense of recreating the tangles but in a different way rather than just sort of etching over them. I mean, there's a way, I mean, accuracy and, f- and fidelity are not necessarily the same thing. Um, mm-hmm. And, and a, a perfectly accurate translation uh, could be unfaithful in, in all sorts of different ways. I mean, the, the most recent example, I suppose, that springs to mind is that uh, Julian Barnes' review of um, the Lydia Davis yeah. Flaubert, where he thought that the the, the, the accuracy of her translation actually interfered with the fidelity of the translation because Flaubert was such a, such a stylist and, and he felt that there were clunks in the prose that actually Flaubert would never, never have tolerated. You know? That's right. I mean, I, actually, I was thinking about this. One of the writers that I like very much, Latin American writers, is Julio Cortázar, who's, who was read a lot, I think, in the 60s and 70s here and is no, no longer really recognised at all as a name. And sometimes I look at the English translations and I think that they do... Um, give an account of what's said but I think that's not the guy you know that's not the man I know from reading you know he's a character in his own stories right and do, do you well, don't that's where the, the, another panel that's happened here I don't think this year but maybe last year is um is about retranslation or certainly it's something that translators talk a, talk a lot about at what point if a really great author who's recognized as great like Cortázar in a whole continent at what point do we say or does a publisher say maybe it's time to actually re- readdress these translations because if they're really not living or doing anything here, you know, a really great book can live on and on and on and on. You know, I, I only just picked up in an airport Lolita the other day because I hadn't read it, you know, so that, that's a confession. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you, know, it was in, you know, it was there, it was on the front table, ridiculously, really. I think that's but, got to be the most important thing. Does the translation live? Does it, does it persuade you? In this? I mean, it's exactly as, as Toby was saying, you know, in a way, the, the question of what works in translation is, is, is the same as what works in, in prose in general. Does it have... Uh, you know, rhythm and structure and power and fluency and it, you know, does it persuade you? Does it keep you reading? Does it, does it have a life? Um, and w- one of the peculiar peculiarities of translation is it actually gets to have more of an afterlife than the original. So we don't, as, as readers of Dickens, we don't get a new version of Dickens because we don't need it retranslated. But, you know, the new version of Cortazar will, will change that slightly. So in a way, the afterlife is actually more potent in the book that's not in the original language. But that, that raises a key question, doesn't it? You know, do you need a new translation of Tolstoy, given that Tolstoy was written when it was written? You know, do you need it for now, mm. when he was writing for then? But, you know, in some ways, I feel that our own language gets very dated, you know, that there is a sort of 19th century or even a 1920s version of English that is really no longer spoken and makes us feel that the book itself is dated, possibly in ways that it is, Possibly in ways that it doesn't have to be. I mean, but, and, and you know, one of the many interesting things of reading 19th century fiction is you get to immerse yourself in the language of the time. So, I mean, that, that's interesting. But then, but is, then the, is the translation yeah. impeding yeah. that? Well, yeah, exactly. It, it could well be. So, one of the things that people say about Moncrief Proust, I think, is that um, because Moncrief and Proust sort of inhabited a similar world and they, they, they occupied a similar space in that mm. world. There's a even even if the language isn't necessarily contemporary to our ear, there's a sort of there's a there's a there's a fit to it. If you know what I mean, it sort of it, it fits because there was a because there was a film and they shared something that that modern translators wouldn't necessarily share. And yet there have been lots of uh, well the the new translation of Proust, that whole series edited by John Sturrock. You know, um, I mean I don't know if you've compared them. I haven't, but <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that that someone should embark on that. You know, clever people. <laughs> I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say, as you said, I think it all depends on the book. I mean, if you look at the, you know, people always say translation's impossible, but everything's translatable, and along that spectrum, you know, you have to you have to find out kind of where a particular book fits on that spectrum. And obviously, it's with certain books, you'll be having to travel a, a greater distance from the original than with others. And, uh, and, and all, not every sentence in every book is the same kind of sentence. You know, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have to do more in certain parts of a book than in other parts of a book. So I think it depends very much on the particular experience of a particular translator with a particular book. 
There are no rules. Another question that I've never heard asked, but that's kind of occurring to me more and more, the more I translate, is, is, is there such a thing as a good translator? Or do you meet your match? Do you find the right book? If, if, if translation is about, like, like what you were just talking about with Proust, you know, him and his translator shared some something, no? Be it, I don't know, be it they lived in the same neighborhood in a city or they, they, they married the same woman 10 years apart, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Only 10 years apart. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it reminds me, there's that, there's that Borges short story, um, which is his great joke on translation, which is that the translator of Quixote uh, has to inhabit the life of Cervantes, but, but he can't because he's doing it 400 years later and he does everything in his power to try to completely recreate this life and it's, you know, it's, it's his joke about the impossibility of doing that and obviously Moncrief and Proust may have lived these <coughs> similar lives but they were not the same person and yeah. it was never going to be the same thing. So. And actually Michael Hoffman, going back to Hoffman, it, it, there's a lovely essay that I'm sure most people here have read that's called, I think, Sharp Biscuit. Um, in a Hoffman-esque way. He, he once wrote something, somebody was a sharp cookie in a book, and it was very heavily criticised, I think maybe by A.S. Byatt, who said, um, what is a sharp cookie? <laughs> well, a cookie, you know, it's, it, it's, you know, it's like sweetheart cookie, it's not cookie biscuit. Um, no, and, and Michael Hoffman says, I wouldn't never use that word. In fact, there's another word. I think he says gobsmacked at another point, and that's also criticised. You know, this, this, this is just this character wouldn't have said this, or this author would never have written the word gobsmacked. Well, the author didn't speak English, so we don't know whether the author would have used gobsmacked. And he says, oh, I don't use gobsmacked. But what does happen in my translations is that every single book that I might have read, every conversation that I've had in my life, is in that translation too. And he says it's not autobiography as part of a translation process. It's auto autography. It's my life has to go inside this text because I'm not the creative, I'm not the creator of this work of fiction. I didn't create this character. It wasn't my brainchild. But I can't write it in English without all of the little brain children that I've ever come across <laughs> fe feeding and seeping into it. So, so I think a, a good translation is one for me where, where the translator is given the freedom for those influences to, to, to sit on the page and for it not to be too, too accurate, actually. Mm. Mm. So how, how do you work then in terms of meeting your match? I mean, do you go over things with the, um, with the writer that you're translating? Yeah. Mm. If I can, I always do. Um, if I can, I always do. And, and also there's a kind of early question where you sort of test out the writer just to see how open they are to the idea of being playful because obviously if, they're, if, if that's not them then also that's not being faithful to their intention which is again what you always try to do so depending on, on, on them and also depending on the author I've just, Ivan who I've just translated is a debut author and he was wonderfully playful so for example there's a moment in the, in the, in the book where a lullaby is spoken by one of the characters to his little brother and actually, I said to him, oh, so is this a lullaby that you've come up with, or is this a lullaby from somewhere else? It says, oh, it's, I think it's the first Latin lullaby. Like, <laughs> Where are you going to find that? Well, yeah. I don't, yeah. So then I went and spoke to, you know, people that I know who speak Latin, and we spoke about it, and we came up with something good. But I kept hearing Marina Sveta Oh, yeah. And actually, that ended up being relevant. And so I wrote to him, and I said, look, this is a bit of a like long road to where I got to this translation but and I don't I don't want to play around with it unless you're happy for, to oh I love Sveteva oh my god well I'm sure there was something in it from my reading as well so if you I think you have to be open if you're going to go that far but it's it's fun it's it's it's, it's I, 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 th I think the the book's better for those decisions in my opinion it's just much more alive and you know it's a bit of a postmodern reading but every book is alive with every reading and as a translator you're just another reader mm. oh, brilliant. with a big so, responsibility I mean I think the, the, I mean another thing to say is 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 uh, quali the quality of a translation depends in the first instance on the quality of the translator's reading of the book and how deep and rich it is I mean talking about Mar Maria see one of the uh, most noticeable features of, of his style is these long lists of synonyms that his narrators, who are often translators themselves, 
come up with. He's, he, the, his translators are, I mean, his narrators are people who read the world, really, and, and, and weigh relative meanings all the time. And I think there's something about what translation is in that. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a constant reading and rereading. And a, I mean, I'd be interested to know what you think about that. But the, you know, just have I got it? Have I understood it? Could something else be better? I mean, all these different shades, and it's a constant revision and... I think where you can't ask the author, um, have a friend or a partner listen to it. Where, you, where you're stuck, read it out loud. Mm. Let someone else... It, you could, you're the only one who has the patience or is pedantic enough to say, but this that word actually means 15 things and I could do it. <laughs> but as long as you read it and someone else enjoys it, and, and with someone honest, obviously, <laughs> and, and another good reader, but I think, I think that's key as well. You, know, you are writing the book for an English audience. It, it, they are the people that I bow to, my reader, like, you know, whoever's reading it or whoever's listening to it. Um, it sometimes the author will say no, but more often than not you say, but actually this really does sound much more fluent, and I think really most authors want it to sound fluent. Mm. I like the idea of, sort of translating in psychoanalysis where you somehow get... <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had to deal with an author who thinks they speak English better than they do? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You don't have to name names. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> no, I think most. I think no, but you're you're opening out that conversation as well. It's. I mean, that's fine. That's fine because you've asked them, so you are asking for their help. And lots of authors don't really want to know. It's just kind of well, that's that's your job now. Go for it. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. No comment on that. <laughs> Sure. I mean, there is another issue with, I mean, I suppose this has come up somewhat between the lines, about um, somehow the trans bit of translation being wrong. You know, that you're um, really so much of what, what you're bringing into another country is site specific. And you don't, you can't take it away from the place that it's written in or it's written about. Um, sometimes there'll be slang, you know, say, say there's, there's some corner of Mexico, for example, we've been talking about, you know, uh, northern Mexico, where there's sort of narco slang or whatever. Um, I'm thinking about one book in particular. Um, are you going to turn that into Cockney? No. You know, of course, it's not the same story. But, but what are you going to do with it? So there's a sort of, you can't translate it. You can't bring it somewhere else. You've got to keep it where it is, but rewrite it or write over it. Or, you know, what do you do with things that are just, it, they have to be where they are? Is that, that's, the question goes back to our title, what works in translation? Can that work, can that work really live in translation? Mm. Or does, some, some, does too much of it disappear and, or, or, or become too obtuse to the English reader? I think, I think I've, in, in answer to an earlier question, I have thought of something that possibly doesn't work. And it's not a book I've read, but I got in a, a piece early this week um, about uh, a Finnish novel set during the Second World War. Um, and it was written, the original was written with a great deal of slang. It was army slang and Finnish slang. So that's, you know, the sort of devastating combination. And according to the critic, as I say, I haven't read the book, my critic said, it's been translated into this folksy kind of Midwest American slang, oh. which seems like a very odd choice. But then what are you going to do as a translator? Because you don't, you know... You, you, and he, my critic's conclusion was this, just, this book does not work very well in translation. And, and I thought that was, that was interesting and possibly contentious and it made me bristle a little bit. And I thought, well, does anything not work in translation? But it, was, it, it threw up a couple of interesting questions, I thought. Mm. Well, I was going to mention um, Tim Parks as a critic who's, who's been writing quite interestingly about this question of, of uh, a, a sort of a trend as he sees it for novels which are deliberately written without a great deal of local flavour in order to be in order, in order to be you know easier for for, for, for different countries in different languages uh, I, Peter Stamm the Swiss writer would be a writer he picks out as someone who writes in this this quite flat style as he sees it and, 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 not, and, and, and you know his novels are set in Switzerland but he often doesn't say where they're set really that he doesn't really give you a great deal of local colour about places or people um, so I don't know maybe, that, maybe that's something that other people detect as well I'm not sure now, I wondered that about Michel Welbeck actually was just he's incredible well I can't say he's easy to translate I haven't tried to translate it but I don't imagine it would be that difficult in other words you know I, I sort of wondered whether his popularity was to do with the fact that he writes very, very simple French, you know. 
and that, that some of the concerns are, are vaguely universal, well, universal amongst a certain group of people, a certain group of incredibly misogynistic men. <laughs> um, can, we, can we come around perhaps to this idea of, we've been talking a little bit before, of other countries having a tradition of sort of writers translating other people's work. So, you know, um, novelists also being translators. And I remember an Argentinian writer said to me that when he was growing up, uh, well, he read uh, Edgar Allan Poe to begin with, which you might think is very strange until you realize that actually it was Julio Cortázar who brought Poe into Spanish. And so there are a whole load of, you know, there's a, a generation of Argentinian writers who grew up reading Poe, um, which has had a, an interesting influence. But he said, uh, I just assumed that all translators were also novelists. Um, and, and the same, I think, in France, where if you imagine that perhaps the more universal language is English, and so these other writers will bring those English works um, into French or Spanish, um, that's how they arrive with their readers, is via a poet, a short story writer, a novelist. And we don't really have that, um, but we do have... And, and perhaps we should have that, so that's a question for you. But um, we do have some translators who are much more writerly than others. And Simon, you wanted to sort of extol the virtues oh, of... Well, I just think great <laughs> translators are great writers. They have to be. Yeah. They have to make the same decisions as writers. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a different kind of creativity, but it's creativity nonetheless. And I just think um, it's a point that doesn't often enough get made, that good translators are some of the best writers we have. I mean, Javier some Marias... Some of the best stylists, I'd say. Because, well, maybe that's a good difference. Yeah. Because we don't, I don't have an imagination, none at all, <laughs> none. But surely reconstructing a, maybe, it, again, it depends on different kinds of books, but surely reconstructing a, a book in a totally different language is, a, is, a, is an imaginative exercise in itself. Yeah, no. Um, As a reader, we imagine, so in that sense, I imagine, but... In terms of plotting. In terms of plotting, yeah. Sure, no, sure, sure, no. sure, yeah, yeah. But I mean, Javier Marias has translated Margaret Jules Costa. I think she's just a fabulous writer, and she writes in so many different styles because so many of her writers have different voices, and she finds she manages to find equivalents for those. Well, it's gone full circle in that case because um, Javier Marias is a brilliant translator himself. Yeah, so, and 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 he says that he wouldn't be the writer that he was today without translation. Yeah, and, without and, having translated. And the writers he translated show up as influences in the work. Yeah. Um, these digressive writers like Lawrence Stern and their, their, their Marius is a very digressive writer himself so it's clear I think. Mm. Thank you. Toby, did you have anything to add? before? Uh, no, no. I, 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 <laughs> okay. Um, we ought to open it out to you I think there's some time for questions if you have them and um, will you put your hand up if you do and there's a, probably a microphone somewhere is there? Yes, there's a microphone there um, Yes, sorry in the far corner there, thanks Yeah, hi there Yeah, hi um, I know you may have touched on it just uh, previously. Uh, right. Can you all hear me now? Yes. So I know you may have touched upon it just previously, but I just wanted to know, uh, for example, I deal with Arabic to English. And Arabic being a, quite a rich language, it's quite difficult to find idioms or uh, terms that are, uh, sometimes they're specific to a certain region. And I wondered how would you deal with that? Sometimes I find idioms that just don't exist uh, in English. So how would you, you can explain it in a footnote or an endnote or something like that, but how do you keep the, uh, the flow going of the actual text? Thank you, yeah. Well, having just said I don't have an imagination, I think in those cases it's, it's, it's maybe it's not an imagination, it's a, it's a matter of just keeping your ears open, isn't it? Because there will be a way, you'll lose something, but you never know, you, you might you might gain something as well. I mean, for example, in, in Spanish, so you just mentioned that there's a richness to, 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 your, to your source language that perhaps you don't feel in, your, in, in the target language, your, your English language. But, but there, will be, there will be a meeting point. And I think you win some and you lose some. It's a, if, you, if, you re, if you're doing a book, sometimes you think, actually, that's a bit funnier than it was in that, or you know, in that language. Or, or I had one um, that I had to do yesterday which was, um, the, the phrase in Spanish was, as, he's as black as petroleum, and we, we, don't, we don't say that, or it's, it's kind of as pitch black as petroleum, it might be the better way to describe it as a, as a literal translation, but we say uh, pitch black, we don't say dark, the word was dark, it was very important that it wasn't black, because it was actually describing the, you know, the race of someone, so, uh, and this was talking about a Mexican boy being very dark skinned. And petrol being a very Mexican reference. Also. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So, and I just heard my, my grandfather's voice just out of nowhere because I was thinking, dark as what? You know, dark, 
dark as night, well, it's, a bit, it's not quite as fun, it's not as playful. This is dark as a funeral tie is something that my granddad used to say. So I do think that you have to keep your ears open. And if I hear, if I hear anything that someone said, you know, if I'm in a black cab and there's this amazing cockney talking to me, then I take notes or I try and remember <laughs> what he's saying. Because there were, I think with idioms, you just have to keep your ears open and a notebook out. <laughs> Is there another question? Yes, go ahead. Hang on. Wait. The mic is coming to you. Thanks. Uh, Sophie, you alluded to oddities of uh, writers' names and funny settings with your Spanish surname and Indian setting and Australian publisher. But three critics in front of us, I'm curious, how do you deal with oddities in, in those issues if you're reviewing a translation that's actually happened? For instance, I know of two forthcoming translations this year from Swedish into English, both set in rural England by different writers. The Swedes have run out of settings and so they're now, <laughs> using, they're now using Britain. How do you feel about reading a translation set in something you're very familiar with? Thanks. I, think, I think I'm fairly open to that idea. I mean, again, if, if, if it works as a novel and it holds together, then I don't have a, a preconceived problem with that. I, actually, another Swedish book arrived on my desk yesterday and it's, about, it's a novel about Alan Turing. And I did for a second, I thought, what, why is it? And I thought, well, a Swede is allowed to write about Alan Turing. There's, there's no problem with that. So. Yeah, I don't really, I don't have a pre prejudged difficulty. Likewise. Yeah, you know, um, the Mexican, well, uh, uh, there are a lot of Mexicans here, sorry, we are slanted towards <laughs> Mexico, but it is Mexican week or whatever it is, yeah. Um, the Mexican writer Enrique Krause gave a talk the other day at the British Library saying he thought that the British had more or less invented Mexico. Um, <laughs> And he said, you know, and he, he gave this talk about D.H. Lawrence and Malcolm Lowry and uh, Sybil Bedford coming to Mexico, writing about it, and, and how the foreign eye had somehow actually uh, given Mexican writers something. And so that can, that can happen too. I mean, maybe that's what we should hope for in a, a Swede writing about the UK. Javier Marias is another good example. He wrote a book, All Souls, which is a brilliant book about Oxford yeah. <laughs> from a Spaniard. Yeah. And he, I think his foreigner's eye caught it better than many yeah. Oxfordians Sometimes would. Sometimes I see it more honestly, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Oh, sorry, we'll come to you in a minute. Hello, uh, my name is Tuesday Bambri. I'm a translator and an academic. So this was a really interesting panel to me because I always miss that connection between translators and critics coming together. Um, my question would be about the retranslating classics question that you touched on. Um, I always wonder if that the need for retranslations isn't linked to um, changing perspectives on what a good translation would be. Um, so maybe a translation from the 1920s would have changed Russian names into English names, Russian place names into English place names, I don't know. Um, a translation from the 90s would have been on the opposite end of the spectrum with lots of footnotes, a glossary and a huge introduction. And my question to the critics would be, where are we now? What do you expect us translators to do specifically? You've been talking about it in fairly abstract terms, sort of the transparent pane of glass, etc. But what does that mean concretely? You've talked about slang, we've talked about idioms. I found that really helpful to hear what critics want from us today. Um, well, well I, I, don't, I mean, I, I suspect, I'd be interested to hear what translators think about this, but I suspect that a lot of retranslations happen um, partly because a translator reads something that has previously been translated, say, a long time ago in the original and, and just thinks, well, something's been lost here. Or I don't respond to this book in the same way that this translator seems to have responded to this book. And so I suspect a lot of it is, um, you know, a transla translator's feeling they have something different to bring to the book and different to draw out of the book. I mean, I think that's probably true of uh, Pavir and Volokonsky, these, this husband and wife duo who translate Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and Chekhov and people. They read Constance Garner and, and just felt that she'd... Uh, Dostoevsky was totally lost, you know, and, and, and they, wanted to, they wanted to bring something of the original back into the English. They wanted to reveal more of the texture. Um, so I suspect that's probably how a lot of it happens. And I think it's probably not just a question of different attitudes towards translation over time, but different attitudes towards the text at time. So, you know, what we thought of crime and punishment in the 1920s is different from what we think of it now with 95 years of extra critical baggage behind it. So, yeah. I wonder also whether it isn't to do with... Um, this is dangerous ground. Um, Britain having a, a slight history of xenophobia, frankly, um, and, and whether we are actually more open to foreign names, uh, foreign things, uh, than we were 
before. And, I mean, that's true of listening to football commentators. How many foreign names do you hear them saying now when before they were all British? And so, you know, maybe we have to embrace that and say, actually, we are now a country that can take in foreign, foreigners and foreignness in a way that it couldn't before. And that, that perhaps is the most positive reason for a retranslation, you know, that you can just bring it in, be very casual about it, rather than have the glossary or have the sort of transliteration of a Russian name or, you know, I don't know. I would, would, I have a question. Sorry, it's not my place to ask questions, but um, dual, dual, dual translations, because that's something actually, I'm trying to go to your question again, the trends in translators and their, and their processes. It seems to, seems to me that there are maybe perhaps more, there's, we are encouraged as young translators and new translators, as I am, to, to, to work with other people, which is a joyous thing in, in practice, but how would you receive a book? How, how do you, you know, there was a book by Eduardo Halfon that was translated by a number of people who were here, by the way. <laughs> um, does that put you off, or does that, do you think, why did it need to, does that do anything? Do, do you kind of get a ding, ding, ding? Well, if if, if you see two translators' names, one author, and four translators or two translators, because I think it's happening more and more, and I think it's it's an excellent way to translate. Personally, a single, a single text, all single the, text, all one book, text. two translators, one author's name, two 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 people ne- necessary to translate. It's possibly it. a failure of imagination. I don't think it's even occurred to me for that to bother me in any way. I think it's yeah, no, not 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 in any way. I mean, provided you don't then get two voices in the final yeah. thing. I think that's you know, <laughs> yeah. provided they they. They, they meld together in a, in, a, in a sort of satisfying way. I don't, it wouldn't be at all a problem, I don't think. Thank you. Um, did you still have a question here? Yes, yeah, sorry, there's somebody in the front who was missed there. Let me see. Yes. Um, I was just wondering, we were talking earlier about um, you like to receive a text that's, that's fluent and reads well, obviously. Um, sometimes, like I'm reading a book at the moment that's translated from Spanish, and there are a lot of... Um, words that remain in Spanish and I don't understand because I'm not a Spanish speaker but you kind of it feels right that they're there because the voice is very much from a specific culture and I think that's what the book is for I was wondering whether you think there are any ethical issues in basically or whitewashing someone's voice to fit with this culture rather than putting up with a slightly less fluent translation that highlights the difference rather than bringing it completely into our culture. Mm. Thanks, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I suppose I, one thing I'd say is I don't, I don't think that lit, conversations about translation often seem to uh, go to two extremes. There's the idea of whitewashing someone's voice, and then there's, then there's the idea of uh, leaving some of the original in it. I mean, I, you know, you don't necessarily have to be one or the other. There are ways of retaining flavour which are not necessarily um, which don't necessarily amount to leaving words untranslated um, and, and, and translating those words is not necessarily whitewashing. I think there are, there's, a, there's a huge complex middle ground that, uh, that, that translators operate in. Yeah and I suppose the proofs in the reading, if you're reading this book and you have a sense of these Spanish words despite not speaking Spanish and having been left in then that's fine. If you, as soon as as a reader you begin to find that jarring then something's gone wrong. So, is there, is there a question of sort of if the writer didn't have those words in another language, then leaving them in the opposite language? You know, it, the, the sort of inversion of the I don't know what you call that sort of reversed out. You know, why would you leave certain words in a foreign language, whichever one the original is in, if in the original they weren't in a foreign language? I mean, it's sort of not quite. It, do you think you try and find a way of doing that? Or? I try and find a way. But again, you were, you were just talking, for example, about the case of northern Mexico, uh, literature coming from North Mexico at the moment. There just simply won't be a word for certain things. I, I, and, the, and you won't be able to find anything else. So the things don't exist. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not a big fan of footnotes, but I think, you know, and they're certainly out of, out of fashion, perhaps I'd say. Um, I think if a word gets used regularly and becomes a sort of motif and a, a, the story around it starts to give you an idea of what it means, then I would leave it. And I'd, but it's always just a case-by-case case question, really. Mm, thanks. Oh, sorry. Yes. 
Uh, one at the back, and then I think you have a question. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to make a point on, on using the original word in, in, in a book. Um, in a book, I'm translating. Um, the, the, in the book, I'm translating. So that is, is a, a, an Italian book, and the author is using words from the dialect. And in the original text, she's actually explaining the words to the Italian audience. So in cases like that, I think you need to use and retain the original word because that is the intent of the author in the first place. Yeah. Well, look, we were talking earlier about a girl as a half-formed thing. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> how do you begin? How, how, you know, we, we don't need explaining to. We, 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 we feel that book, don't we? We feel the style, we feel how she's feeling, and which is the magic of it, um, without understanding a word she's saying for the first 20 pages. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying it's effectively in a foreign language anyway, yeah. I think so, and yeah. that book works. So I think basically, you know, this whole thing about do people read books in translation? Well, if they read A Girl is a Half-Formed Thing, it's because the critics tell them to, and because it's at the front, on the front page of the front table of the bookshop and just display table. Um, you know, People don't have a thing against translation. More translations need to happen <laughs> no, uh, and, cool. and be available. That's your job, you two. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, my name's Eben, and I'm Danish English, so I translate both ways. Um, and it's just interesting. I have a comment and a specific question. It's just interesting coming from a small country where translation or literature and translation is never a question. It's normal. It yeah, just yeah. is yeah, 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 yeah. because we're used to it. And I think Britain and America has a lot to learn. So maybe you should talk to your small cousins around the world and, you know, find out how it's not a problem. And translations like any text is living, like one of you said earlier, it's constantly changing and it depends on who translates it and who reads it, whether it's a good or a bad translation. Anyway, that was just a comment from a small country. Um, my specific question is actually also related to my own country, which some of you may know. We have a lot of debates about political correct um, ways of criticizing. Um, we've had uh, some cartoons and stuff, and, and there's a very heavy debate, which is not at all as present in Britain. But I'm just thinking, because I'm actually translating a book that has that's from the 60s and it references the early 19th century in America and some of the wording in there is not really politically correct anymore how would you as critics regard that because I find it really difficult personally I you know I think political correctness is not necessarily a bad thing in a, again you have to reflect the time that you're translating blah -de blah you get my drift I'm just wondering what your thoughts are mm, thank you well, I, suspect, I mean, I suspect it partly depends on what role those words are playing in the book. I mean, if they're integral to a character or, or, a, or a situation, um, I imagine it's going to be quite hard to soften it up, you know, and, and change it for a contemporary audience. If, on the other hand, um, they're not integral, they're just incidental, um, or you could interpret them as incidental, then... Um, you could argue that they just be a distraction uh, if, 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 if left as they are. So it depends, I think, on, on the role they play in the, in the book. Although, although I do wonder, I agree with you, but I wonder how, to what extent, words that are now considered offensive that weren't considered offensive 100 years ago are ever actually incidental, because they might still have been true. offensive. It's yeah. just the prevailing attitude at the time was there was nothing wrong with being offensive. So I think my, my, my sense would be to kind of, it's probably important to preserve the prevailing culture that this book comes from because that's that is truest to yeah it's original or even though your readers are receiving it in a different culture even, even though your readers because because the readers who are reading that in, in in the original are receiving it as the original right, right. and that's that's what you want to try to get as close to as possible i would imagine as a translator i guess there's a question also of why the book is being translated and why you want to translate it and why the publisher wants to publish it given given those um because i mean some books disappear for a good reason and uh <laughs> Thank you. Now, it looks like we're going to have to wrap this up, I'm afraid, because um, we have no time left. But thank you very, very much for coming. And please do join me in thanking our panellists uh, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.